Well, thank you again for choosing to worship with us today here at Roser Church. We are so glad to have you in person and online. Let me ask you a question today to begin. What comes to mind when I say the word radical? <laughs> for some of us, it's a dangerous word. It's a negative word, especially if we're in a safe and comfortable place. If we hear somebody branded as a radical, we, we immediately think troublemaker, right? They're, they're trying to uh, change things. They're trying to disrupt things. They're trying to mess with our comfort zone. It's a negative word. But other times we think of it as a good word, right? Because sometimes you have to take radical action because the problem is very, very severe. A halfway approach won't work, so you have to do radical surgery. You have to some, do something major in order to fix a problem. But often when you do something radical, it means you ask some very unpopular questions. It messes with people's comfort zone. It requires them to deal with something they'd rather not deal with. So whenever you press that limit, you know you're going to get pushback. Some of you know the name Sir John Templeton. He American-born, but he was kind of a pioneer in the British banking and investment world. That's where he earned the title Sir. He was known for his conservative value approach method of investing. In 1954, he began the Templeton Growth Fund, and it grew rapidly. He was one of the first folks to invest heavily in the emerging Japanese market. And even though he was a conservative investor, valued-based investor, that fund grew at record rates. But Templeton was also a deep man of faith. He served for many years on the board of Princeton Theological Seminary, even the chairman of the board. And while in the business world he was seen as a conservative, traditional person, in the church world he got a different kind of reputation. Because in the very conservative, kind of traditional Presbyterian dogma world, he wasn't allowed to ask questions. Like, the questions were resolved. We had all the dogma, we had all the answers. All the questions had been asked and answered. He kind of grew up in that environment. And so he was so audacious that he would go out there and say, do we really know all the answers? Maybe we can dialogue with other religions and other perspectives. Maybe we, brothers and sisters in Christ, should admit that there are some things we don't know. There are mysteries not meant to be solved, and we don't have to have all the answers all the time. Well, needless to say, when he was willing to ask those uncomfortable questions, he began to get pushback. In print, he, he received kind of attacks in print. There was one article that said, listen, don't be deceived by how conservative and traditional he is in the business world. In the church world, he's a radical. But Templeton was unfazed. He responded. He said, I wouldn't call it radical. I would just call it enthusiasm for progress. <laughs> enthusiasm for progress. He just wanted to see things change for the better. It wasn't radical. Sometimes radical gets this meaning because it's destructive in nature, that you're trying to destroy something. But he wants to see progress. He wants to see healing. Often when you're labeled as a radical, you're pushing back against the status quo. You're, you're asking questions that make people uncomfortable. Produces anger or fear or some sort of indignation. It's interesting, though, to think that Jesus created all these reactions. <laughs> in his life, in his world, people were angry with him. They were afraid of the changes he was proposing, indignant about how he was messing with traditions, especially with religious leaders of his day. In that day, people called him a radical. They were afraid of the changes he was introducing. They wanted to silence him to the point that they killed him, to shut him up. Jesus was enthusiastic, enthusiastic for progress, God's plan of progress, to make people better, not just to get wealthier, not to become more powerful, 
but better people to improve the world. Jesus was enthusiastic for that. God was enthusiastic for that. He took radical steps. He sent His Son into the world to die on a cross. How radical is that? All to demonstrate and prove how much God wants things to get better. We've been following the story of the early church. Those first days after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to be with the Father. And how the Spirit of God after that began a new work of God to take the message of love and the covenant of love that God has with His people into all the world, to all people for all time. It's, it's a message and a process and a healing process that continues to this day. And We've been studying those first few days because God is lighting that spiritual fire in that church, a fire that He wants to continue to spread. And we've been asking, how do we be part of that spreading progress? How do we get enthusiastic for progress? And so today we want to look at this story one more time. Actually, we have two more times. Come back next week. (laughs) We want to see what we can do to be a part of the solution. How do you respond to this kind of radical love of God? And it turns out the Spirit of God is doing some radical things. The radical love of God that they experienced, it forced them, it challenged them, it engage them to make radical differences of their own. And God does some radical things himself. The first thing we see here is that there's some radical growth that takes place as a result of their response. In response to the radical love of God, God works to extend this community in a radical way. Look at verse 41, chapter 2. We read this report that after Peter gave his sermon, look what happened. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000. Remember, we talked about Pentecost last week. Peter spoke, but then everybody else was speaking in a language that made sense to the people that were there. So this message was repeated over and over again. In response to all of that, 3,000 people said, you know what, I want to follow Jesus. The Spirit of God did that. Recently, I had the privilege of preaching at the all-island service put on by the Kiwanis. The churches, many of the churches in the island participated in that. And the estimates of attendance there were somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000. So about the same number. So if you were there, or maybe you saw it in the paper, you saw pictures, you get a feel for what that number looks like. And you just imagine, imagine all those people said, there's water, let's get baptized, let's follow Jesus. You can kind of feel what they felt. Now, that didn't happen that day. Many of those folks had already been baptized. They had other plans, and quite frankly, the sermon wasn't very good, so they're not going to receive it. But you get a feel for the number. Can you imagine the Spirit of God doing it? And here's the interesting thing. Nobody planned that. There was no committee. There was no agenda. There was no budget. There was nothing. Just people telling the story of Jesus in a language that made sense to the people. And God did this work. He created this spiritual organism. 3,000 people whose lives were changed just because somebody told the story of Jesus in a language that makes sense. Amazing what God will do through that little bit of work. See, He's growing a spiritual organism. It's an organism only He can grow. We can't make people be different. God does that. Our role is to tell the story. So there is this numerical growth, this radical growth, 3,000 in one day. I mean, God is doing something here. Now, of course, the cynical among us will say, okay, that's great, that was a great event. You know, one and done, it was great that it happened once. Those people, they probably, nothing, nothing's going to come of it. They're going to get tired and walk away. But the story continues in Acts. And it focuses on the people there in Jerusalem. Now, we don't know. Remember, we started with 120 people. We don't know how many of those 3,000 stayed in Jerusalem. But we get this story of the people continuing to grow spiritually, but in a very powerful way. Look at verse 42. These people, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with the awe at the many wonders of and signs performed by the apostles. Look at all the things they were doing, not just one thing. See, in response to this 
radical love of God, they were doing many things to grow deeper in a spiritual way. They were listening to the apostles' teachings. They couldn't wait to learn more about Jesus. That was just the first lesson. Well, what did he say? How does that change our lives? What, how does he help me do this? They were listening to the apostles every day. They're listening to grow. Something about responding to the radical love of God says, we must know more. And they fellowshiped together. They got together, shared with one another, prayed with one another, encouraged one another, broke bread together, wine together. They began to even worship together. Probably that breaking of bread is probably a reference to what Jesus told them to do. Eat this bread, drink this wine, and remember some me. They began to worship together. You see, right away, part of the radical response of these people to God's radical love is to be in a community and do these things together. To learn together. That takes a lot of commitment. To me, that's part of the most radical thing that happens here is these people, like they change their priority structures of their life. They said, whatever else we do, we've got to learn together, we've got to pray together, we've got to meet together. Nothing can stop us because here's the thing. God will not do His work Otherwise, in me and in the world, this requires radical commitment, a radical change of priorities. See, we've kind of grew up in a church culture that now this is all secondary. Learning about Jesus when I get time to it. Meeting with other Christians when I get around to it. I'm kind of busy. We've lost some of this realization that if we're going to be effective in the ministry of Christ, there's got to be a radical devotion, a radical commitment to spiritual growth. We've got to learn to think differently. Our minds have been contaminated by the thoughts and the directions and the culture of this world to such a degree it won't get cleansed unless we put some time into it where the Spirit of God will work. Now, of course, this is where the organization comes in. Right? Somebody said, well, when are we going to meet? What time are we going to meet? Who's bringing the bread? Who's going to pay for the bread? See, God invents the organism, but then we have to start inventing the organization. When two or three are gathered, you have a committee. It's a kind of a rule. Right? We have to discuss. We have to decide. We're going to agree, disagree. But here's the thing. Here's the important part about that organization. The Spirit of God is working in it. It's not just a random organization. It's an organization put together for the express purpose of God working through that organization so that we can be together and we can share bread together and we can worship together and we can pray together. That organization means something. It's a radical thing in this world. What you're doing right now, this is radical. The world's out there golfing and on their boat. And you said, no, we're doing this today. I grew up as a kid, every Sunday, you were in the car. Like, you could miss church if you were dead. That was the only way you could miss church. I think I missed church like twice in the 18 years that I lived at home. Because my parents believed this wasn't an option. This was, this is crucial if we're going to be a part of God's changing work in this world. It requires radical devotion to spiritual growth. And here's the thing, as they did that, God continued to work. It says there are ongoing miracles by the apostles, signs and wonders. There are signs that God is working. One of the great blessings I have as a pastor is to listen over and over again to the signs that God is working through you, the miracles that are happening, not just healing ministries, but relationships that are healed, all because somebody out there has taken seriously this radical devotion to grow spiritually in God's family. But there was another radical implication here, not just of growing spiritually, but there's a radical caring that goes on here. Look at verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give it anyone who had it need. These are radical troublemaking world words in our world. Like, why are we giving away our possessions and our property? Because, you know, we've worked for them our whole lives. They're for us. We've been saving. We've been scrimping. It's now time to enjoy them. That's our safety net. That's what we fall back on. Our possessions, our property, they belong to us. There are all kinds of reasons not to give. 
this way, of course, because we need a safety net. We need to be comfortable. We need to be certain. There's all kinds of reasons not to give to this level. Most of us, what we do is we establish some kind of halfway point, right? We give, but never to the point of being uncomfortable. Right? We give, we have plenty, so we can give a little bit, and it makes us feel good because we're making a dent. We can give a little bit, and we can still be comfortable. We can do everything we want to do, but we can make a dent. But I, I think this early church, they had a different mindset. Instead of trying to make a dent in the problem, their mission was to solve the problem. <laughs> they wanted it solved. They want all the need in their church gone. They just didn't want to feel better about helping a few people. They wanted to solve the problem. Now, maybe they didn't do it all the way, and maybe that created more problems because now you need more committees. Who's collecting the money? Who does it go to? Blah, blah, blah. It creates a lot of problems. And a little later in the story, which hopefully we can pick up later this summer as we follow this story along, it creates problems because now we need an organization to deal with the problem. But they wouldn't give up on solving the problem. They gave and gave and gave and gave. Wouldn't it be awesome to say, man, we have so much money here we don't know what to do with? And they didn't give out of guilt. And I'm not trying to commit guilt here. You know, sometimes we pastors, you know, we're accused of just piling guilt. But I want us to hear it's not about guilt. I, really, I don't want you to give out. Keep your money. I don't, I'm not about guilt. It's not about that. I want us to see the heart of this early church that felt compelled by the radical love of God to give whatever they could to solve the problem. This week, Liz and I were able to go to a wonderful celebration for a group called Turning Points. It's a wonderful a downtown charity trying to make a dent in the poverty of our community. And powerful presentations on many levels, but one fact that stuck in my head is the president was sharing that over the last year, she received like, that organization received like 5,000 requests for housing assistance, 5,000 in one year. And they gave over a million dollars to this program, but they solved 900, a little over 900 cases. So that's awesome, that's wonderful, they made a dent, but that meant 4,000 people were not served. And there's an issue when you see 4,000 people who need housing, and then we have what we have in this culture. See, somebody needs to get that message that things are not going to change with this comfortable giving thing. At some point, we have to be willing to give radically to the point of sacrifice. Jesus gave His life. God sent His Son. That's the example. What sacrifice can we make, not just to make a dent in the problem, not just to make us feel a little better about the problem, but to solve the problem? Really, it's going to take radical caring. We've got to love as much as God loved us, which is impossible to do. And yes, it's going to create problems. And yes, it's going to create committees. And yes, it's going to create arguments. But who cares? We're trying to help the world here. That's a result of responding to the radical love of God. That's a troublemaking message in our affluent culture. But Jesus wasn't afraid to make it. The early church wasn't afraid to make it. But there's one more thing they did. One more thing. Not just radically committing to spiritual growth and caring, but also to worshiping together. Look at verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Did you catch that? Every day. Every day. Now, at this point, we're talking about mostly Jewish people. They, they went to the temple for prayers. So here's the thing. They went to two services. Like they went and met in the courtyard with other believers. Then they went to temple. They went to the 830 and the 10. You know? Like, and not just once a week when they didn't have anything else to do. Like every day they went. Every day they gathered. And then... After church, they had nothing else to do, or after synagogue, I should say. They had not, so then they went home and fellowshiped more, shared with one another. They couldn't get enough of one another. 
Quite often I hear people say, you know, I can work, worship God on my own. I can just go into nature. I can just, you know, meditate and I can worship God on my own. And I always say, absolutely. Absolutely you can. I do. It's important that we do that. But that can't be all we do. Because something happens when we come together. Something happens when we worship together. When we meet together and we encourage one another and praise one another and we hear, or praise one another for their work, praise God together. God works through that and encourages us, makes us realize we're not alone. We are not the crazy ones in our world. That God is working through us. We share stories of need, but also stories of God working. We can be better people together. We can accomplish more if we pull our resources together. We can make a difference in the world. Yes, you can worship Christ on your own. You can be a Christian without going to church. Absolutely. But are you going to make a difference that way? I know it's complicated, and I know the church messes up a lot, and I know there are a lot of issues with the organization. The organization is not perfect. and No organization is perfect. But God is creating His perfect organism through this broken organization. And without commitment to it, and without people engaged in it, it's not going to get better. Worship must be a priority every single week in our lives. At least, this was every day. This is radical devotion to worship. A realization that worship is not for God. It's not like God needs us to praise Him every day. He enjoys it. He invites us to do that. But He doesn't need it. We need it. We need to know who is the focus of our life and who is the focus of this world and what we are here to do and what the people we are meant to do. We need this. And if we don't feel that, then have we really experienced the transforming, radical love of God? See, that's the challenge that this early church presents to us. So what's the point? After looking at all this, we started off with this troublemaking word, radical. We tried to see that there was another view of that. It's, a, it's enthusiasm for progress. And in the case of Jesus in the early church, it's, a, it's an enthusiasm for really changing the world. So I hope what we've learned through looking at this early church is this very basic truth. That God's radical love, it demands our radical response. Not a half-hearted response, not when we get around to it, not if we're busy, not with what little bit of extras I have left. But it demands radical response. Because it's radical love of God. We looked at that one example, just one individual who was radical by asking some questions about admitting what we don't know. There are other radicals. I'm a student of the Reformation. That's my specialty. Of course, when Martin Luther began to ask really uncomfortable questions in the 16th century, he was called a radical. People wanted to kill him, put him on trial, because he was exposing things that people didn't want exposed. He was called a radical. More than 400 years later, Martin Luther King Jr., who was intentionally named after Martin Luther, he started asking very controversial questions about racism in our culture and how we need to face it. And he was called a radical because he was messing with the status quo and asking uncomfortable questions. I'm not afraid of the word radical. Call me a radical if you want. I don't care because really God has done some amazing things through radical people that ask difficult questions. But here's the thing. Don't just be radical to be radical. Don't just be radical to be different. And certainly don't be radical to be destructive. If you're going to be radical, be radical with a purpose. Be enthusiastic for progress. <laughs> the kind of progress that God is seeking to introduce through his son to heal us, to help us think better, to be better people, to be a bar, better part of our world, to help heal the problems. As we face the world's problems of hunger and homelessness and and all the other social ills that come out of this uh, trafficking and all those other kind of things. That problem is going to get healed when the people of God take seriously the call to respond to the radical love with radical action. And if not us, then who? Because we have the best reason of all. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this challenge of the early church. 2,000 years later, we may pride ourselves at how far we have come since those ancient days, but we've just been taught a lesson by folks who 
took seriously the radical love of God enough to do radical things, to grow radically, to worship radically, and to care radically. Make us part of the healing in this world, not just make it dead in it, but make it go away. Because that's the heart of God. And we want to be part of enacting that heart in this world. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.